Good evening, Sports Zillions. How's everybody doing out there tonight? I am Mike Aglio Laurel. I am your host. And this is Sports Zone. Coming live like we do each every week here via the I 95 Sports and Entertainment Radio Network. We got a good show for you tonight. We'll be joined by Dave Hastings and Eric Tress on a matter of moments. And we got a lot to talk about tonight. We are going to be continuing our division by division preview uh, 2018 NFL season. We're getting closer. We are getting closer to the start of the season, which is, of course, next Thursday, September 5th. So tonight we'll be, we will be doing the AFC East division, or we'll be doing one division tonight. And next week we will be doing the NFC Eastern division. And we got some other things to talk about, too. Mano Ginobili officially announced his retirement from the NBA last night after 16 seasons. So we're going to talk about that. This is a little – I'm not entirely sure this is going to be a debate. But this is something I want to bring up, and I'm going to pose to Eric and Dave Hastings when they get on the show in a little while here because – Listening to WFAN yesterday, and the 2020 update comes on, and it says, future Hall of Famer Manu Ginobili. And it just made me think whether or not Ginobili is an actual future Hall of Famer. Because you think about it, he's the second member of San Antonio's Big Three to retire behind the horse Tim Duncan. And I think we all know Tim Duncan is a Hall of Famer. You also have Tony Parker. I would consider him a fringe Hall of Famer because at one point you could consider him among the best point guards in the NBA. And that brings us to Ginobili because while Ginobili was a great player, without question, and he does have some uh, European League credentials in there, and it may be very well be the European credentials that put him over the top because, you look, he came to the NBA – when he was he was already about and I'm trying to do the math in my head here. He, he was 25 years old when he came came to the NBA. He had already played for about three or four European teams before he came to the NBA. And he was drafted in the second round of the 1999 NBA draft. Didn't come over stateside until about 2002. Four-time NBA champion. He played on all. Uh, he played on four of the five San Antonio championship teams, the first one being, of course, the strike short in the late 90s when they, uh, they uh, beat the Knicks, which is still very painful uh, when you consider the fact that that – I still say if Patrick Ewing had been healthy that season, uh, they, they could have won that championship. But anyway, um, and you look at some of his other credentials, a two-time All-NBA third team in 2018 – 2008 and 2011, two-time NBA All-Star in 05 and 2011, sixth man of the year award in 2008, all-rookie second team in 2003. My problem is I don't think you could have ever considered him the best shooting guard in the league. He had a, a number of different players. There was always Kobe Bryant there. You always had LeBron James in the league, whether he was a shooting guard or small court. doesn't matter talking about the swing man position. I never would have realistically put him in the top five at that position. So I, I don't know if you could consider him a um, a uh, a future Hall of Famer, but we're going to get into that in a little bit. And I welcome to the program Dave. Dave Hayes is here tonight. Dave, how you doing? I'm doing good, Mike. I'm doing good. How about yourself? Not too bad. Not too bad. So – I was going to wait for Eric to get here for this debate, but we do have a couple of things I wanted to talk about with Eric anyway. So while we wait for him, let's get into this, because the first thing I wanted to talk about, talk about tonight, I was doing a little preamp before you could come on here. Manu Ginobili announces his retirement from the NBA after 16 seasons yesterday. And as I said before you came on the air, what really led me to want to discuss this here tonight is I'm listening to WFAN yesterday, and they make the announcement, and they use the phrase future Hall of Famer with Manu Ginobili. And it got me to thinking, I don't really know if I consider him a surefire Hall of Famer. 
But I want to hear your thoughts on it. What do you think? Do you consider Man of Ginobili to be a future Hall of Famer? I 100% consider him a Hall of Famer. Uh, okay. I really don't think there's any question about it. He was and is still, you know, arguably the greatest bench player that's ever played. Um, as, and throughout his con- career, he always, you know, did what was best for the team and went along with Popovich's ways in San Antonio and came off the bench. And I think he got at least one or two six man of the year awards under his belt. But I think we just said it was one actually, but I'm going to check on that. Uh, I'm almost positive it's one, maybe two, but either way, I think, you know, if you look at him statistically, you know, he's up there with some of the greatest players of all time, and yet he came off the bench 95% of his career. Um, you know, did what was best for the team. He, he made clutch shots and clutch moments, played big in several NBA finals, has rings, um, you know, helped. And I just – I look at him, at, and not to mention just being a lefty. You know, that alone, I think, gets you a little props in the NBA because there's very few, you know, left-handed NBA players that have had careers like him. Um, You know, obviously, that's partially contributed to the fact that there's not that many left-handed people in general. Um, But just, I mean, to me, he's he's one of the all-time – he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. I don't even think it's a question if he's a Hall of Famer. I I would – I think he's in in his first go-around – you think about some of the guys, you know, that he's going to go up against, and there's really not many names that can come off the top of my head. You know, you could see him and Tony Parker going in the same year. Um, but I, I just think that those Spurs teams that won those titles with him, Parker, and Duncan, I don't think they win as many of those finals without him being on that roster. And I think that right there is maybe one of the most important parts of determining whether somebody should be in the Hall of Fame. Well, I mean, listen, I would never take away what type of player he was because he definitely was uh, a, a very good player, in my opinion. I, the thing about the Hall of Fame to me, I don't know if he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Now, second or third second or third attempt on the ballot, all right, fine. But you look at some of the players who have gotten in, who I think, while they haven't won the championships he has, you could argue have a, had a – few more accolades. I think of guys like Chris Webber, maybe a Ben Wallace. You know, they, they were – like, Wallace wasn't the scoring presence that Ganolfi was. But, you know, four-time defensive uh, player of the year, I believe Wallace was. Webber was a very prolific scorer for his position, uh, multiple-time all-star. And those guys haven't gotten in the Hall of Fame yet. And I think both of them, in some manner of speaking, deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. The the point I was making before you came on, and I'm glad you brought up the point about him being one of the best bench players of all time, because I I absolutely agree with with that point. It's very hard to argue that point. The problem is he was a starter for a long portion of his career, I believe about five or six years. His six-man of the year award, I believe, came in 2008. But he he was a starter for a lot of it as well. Um, Hang on a second. Ah. We got some people waiting to come online here. And Eric Tressler is here now. Eric, how you doing? Good. I was wondering what was with the awkward long pause. It was with the awkward long pause. Well, seeing as I how couldn't I hear was, anything going on. I was trying to listen. I couldn't hear nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, seeing as how Dave had to deal with that for about 10 minutes last week, I'd say you're still ahead of the game. So you got that going for you? Um, why don't you just kind of mute some stuff here? All right. Um, but anyway, my, my point is, I don't think he's a surefire first ballot Hall of Famer, but I want to hear Eric's thoughts on this. You're talking about Manu Ginobili. Do you think he is a future Hall of Famer? He's a future European Hall of Famer? Oh. He's, he's a future San Antonio Spurs Hall of Famer? Okay. He's He's... He's a Hall of the Very Good Hall of Famer. Uh, I don't know if he's a. I don't know if he's a Hall of Famer. Well, I think we kind of we kind of lean towards more of the same sides because they, David, I'll let you tell him what your position on this was. I th- I think he's a Hall of Famer, no question about it. I also think that he could be a first ballot Hall of Famer based on the. Uh, 
class that Based he on playing with Tim but, Duncan and Tony Parker for 14 years and under Greg Popovich that just gets him in. I, I, I mean, think, I get he was part of their three, but I don't know if there's ever a point in time where you could have said Manu Ginobili was even in the top 10 best players in the league. I don't know if that gets in the Hall of Fame. I'm sorry. I, I, unless it's the Hall of the Very Good now. Unless you just want to put in guys so you can remember them down the road. You know, or if you want to really honor the greats, you know, it, it depends. You know, but I feel this way about a lot of the sports now. I feel like too many guys get in. In football, there's actually a number they have to, like, put in each year. I think that's silly. Some guys don't deserve to be in. But, you know. Well, I, I just think based on – I think personally when it comes down to what those Spurs teams were able to do, I don't think they would have done as much if it wasn't for him. Eric, do you want to? Uh, I mean, I mean, he was good. I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from him. He was great. He was one of the best Europeans to come over and play. I'll give him that. If they have like a European wing of the Hall of Fame, maybe he could squeeze in there. Well, I, I, he's just never been a like. He's he's been really good. Everybody knows Manu Ginobili. He's very very good, but he's not one of the greats. Well, I mean, I, I will say this because before you came on, Eric, I kind of I kind of leaned more towards your side on this because, like, when I first heard this yesterday, and just so you know, like, what spurred this on is I was listening to WFN, I and mean, we were doing the 2020 update, and they called him future Hall of Famer, man, you know, and it just made me stop and think because, first of all, I agree with David's point that the Spurs probably would not have been as good if he was not on that team. He brought something to that team that I don't think anybody else could could have brought to that team. I totally agree with that point. But there have been plenty of players who brought certain things to their teams and would, were instrumental in the team's success that are not in the Hall of Fame. And I, I'm not going to bring up guys like Robert Ory or Derek Fisher because – because I think Ginobili absolutely contributed more to the NBA than you are those guys. So you have that. But for this particular instance, I think you look at what Ginobili did, and Eric, you brought up a good point that I don't think you ever could have considered him a top ten player. I don't think you ever could have considered him one of the top five in his position at any point during his career. Now, before you came on, David, uh, he seems brought up a great point that he's probably one of the best bench players of all time. He definitely reinvented himself as a bench player. But in terms of when he was a starter, again, I just I don't think he was ever one of the best in his position. And I think you look at some of the guys who could be considered among the best in that position who aren't in the Hall of Fame. Uh, before you came on, Eric, I brought up guys like Chris Weber and Ben Wallace. Um, I don't know if you ever could have considered Ben Wallace one of the best in his position, but he definitely was one of the best defenders of the last 20 years. I believe he won four defensive player of the year trophies. And he's not in the Hall of Fame. Then you have Chris Weber, one of the best power forward in the league during his time in the league. He's not in the Hall of Fame either. In my opinion, I think both those guys would have a better case of being a first ballot Hall of Famer than Ganoli did. Uh, what do you think about that, though? Yeah, I think they were both good players. Again, like Ben Wallace had a couple years where maybe he was top defender in the league. And you could say, you know, Ben Wallace struck fear into some guys. I think he was a part of that Detroit team that took down the Lakers in the finals, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, like, he he, he had a spurt there where at least he was one of the top players, at least in his position in the game. So, even though he didn't have much offense, it was all defense and rebounding. Uh. Yeah, I got to think that those guys have as good, if not, uh, you know, better a case than, than Ginobili, in my opinion. Again, I said another, another way for Ginobili. Maybe years down the road, maybe. But, I mean, definitely not first ballot. Definitely not in the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. But, I don't know. I, I'm just not sold on Ginobili. Somebody would really have to sell me hard on Ginobili as, as a uh, Hall of Famer. Well, you brought up his European career, and I definitely think that will play a factor into it. So I do think he'll wind up getting in at either like his second or third attempt, but I, I don't think it'll be first ballot. So 
Dave, would you like to say any final words on this article? No, I mean, look, I think you guys got some good points. I just think for what he's, he did, his longevity, I mean, and like I said, I, I, the bottom line to me is if if it wasn't for him, I don't think those Spurs teams have the, the run that they had. I do well, think I'll give you, I maybe pulled off a championship or two, but I don't think they would have had the run that they had. Let me give you a comparison, though. It was Manu Ginobili. Because I'll guarantee you, both, all of us will agree, this next guy I'm about to mention is a Hall of, future Hall of Famer. No doubt about it in anybody's mind. Was at some point, you know, considered one of the top players in the game. Manu Ginobili never reached this guy's level. All the year, he, he, Dirk. He's never been Dirk. And Dirk's a better European than he was. I don't think he compares at all to Dirk, who I think should be a first ballot Hall of Famer. I mean, that's, that's fair, but I also don't think you can compare those guys' games because Dirk, Dirk I mean, besides the position, uh, of course. He was one of the best players in the game at one point. He was no, he game, top he, 10, top 5 player. He absolutely – nobody can't say. He absolutely was, and I'm not taking that away from you. I'm just saying if you look at the way their teams were structured, Dirk kind of came into, into a position where he had to be the guy right off the bat because you had a guy like Tim Duncan – you know, we had never had to be the number one option. I don't know if that's the point you're making, but I just think that kind of changes the dynamic a little bit. Dave, what do you say? I mean, look, I definitely I, – if you had to ask me who I would put in the Hall of Fame first, I'm definitely putting Dirk in before I'd put Manu, that, if that's the kind of point we're trying to make here. But when it comes down to – like I said, when it's all said and done, I, I, I believe that Manu Ginobili is a Hall of Famer. Mm-hmm. But if, we're, if you're asking me what European player I would take over the last 15 years, Eric, you're 100% correct. I'm taking Dirk Nowitzki over Manu, Manu Ginobili. You know what I think a fairer comparison is, though? Because, yeah, I, obviously you're going to put Dirk in before Manu. I, I don't think that's a fair comparison, though. I think if you're going to compare Manu Ginobili to anybody, you compare him with a guy like Tony Kukoc who was instrumental on those uh, the, the second Bulls dynasty team, the, the second three teams. No, he doesn't get in. Kukoc doesn't get in. He also had the European career that kind of rivals what Ginobili had. So I, I think it's a fair comparison than the Dirk one is all I'm trying to say. Can we, can we all agree, though, that Dirk is probably the greatest European player of all time? Yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah, I, I couldn't. If you gave me till next week's show, I still don't think I could come up with somebody I would say would be better. Yeah, I don't think he exists. I don't think that person exists. I can definitely give you that one. So, And just to, just to give a shout-out, uh, my cousin David's in the chat room. He doesn't think uh, Ginobili's a Hall of Famer either. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Thanks for listening, Dave. But, again, I think this is a great debate, though. And I think this is a debate that a lot of people are going to have over the next four or five years until he comes up for uh, the, the Hall of Fame ballot. And it's one I definitely wanted to bring up here. So I want, I want to thank you guys. I knew I was going to get a, a couple different opinions here. So I thank you guys for, uh, for joining me on that one. Now, Eric, we got some big news coming out of Giants camp because yesterday – Odell Beckham finally gets his contract. He gets $95 million over five years, $65 million guaranteed. Far and away becoming the highest paid wide receiver in the NFL, which is what he wanted the whole time. So what what are your thoughts about this? Um, He's widely considered one of the most, most talented players in the league. He was going to get paid somewhere. Giants made a move, you know. I mean, it's sixty-five million guaranteed. So was that thirteen million a year guaranteed? Uh, well, you take into consideration. Hopefully, he lives up to it. But you know, you never know. Mm-hmm. I got to think that now we have him and Barkley not locked down for the next five years. So I'm feeling pretty good about where our offense is. You know, even if we had to draft a quarterback or bring another quarterback in after Eli, because um, I don't see Eli probably going five years. Mm-hmm. But uh, I like I, I like it. We got a couple guys locked up that have some talent, so we'll take it. He, you know, he deserved to get paid. He, you know, he's done all the right things in the off season. Now I'm hoping he wasn't just doing that to get the contract and that you know. But everything I hear is he, he's a pretty decent guy, and uh, 
you know, that he, he's been doing all the right things, saying all the right things, showing up to mini camps, you know, doing things that they, that weren't mandatory. Um, so I, you know, Giants rewarded him for it. So let's hope it pays off. Mm. Dave, what are your thoughts? Uh, I mean, look, like Eric said, he's done all the right things. I mean, yes, has he kind of been, you know, a headache during the season on the field, off the field, blah, 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 whatever. But when it's come down to what's been going on with the contract talks and, you know, whether he was going to hold out or show up or, you know, whatever, he's done everything the right way. And you have to figure that, you know, just like most players, he's going to mature as he gets older. He, I think, you know, I think – Look, I think he deserves it. Um, you know, it's the funny thing is with the NFL, it's really not even a matter of are you the best player, but are you in the top tier of your position? Because guess what? When it's your contract time, you're going to be the top paid player. Sooner or later, Julio's going to get an extension. He'll become the top paid wide receiver and so on and so forth. It's just how it works. He deserves it, though. I, I'm happy for him. You know, congratulations. But I think the bigger statement this makes is the Giants really are set. You know, we said this after they drafted Barkley, but I think this move also shows you that they really are all in with Eli Manning over the next, you know, maybe two, possibly three, three. years. Yeah. You know, trying to go for a Super Bowl run, and then you know let the you know let things fall where they fall because after that, you know, let's say they do three more years if you include this season. That means Odell Beckham's guaranteed money's already been paid out, so they can cut him if they want to. Saquon Barkley will only have two years left on his rookie deal, and that's if they choose the fifth-year option. Um, you know, so I, I think this is really another sign of hey, the Giants' ownership and coaching staff, management, all of them really do believe that they can make at least one more run with Eli Manning at quarterback. So I think this speaks just as much about Odell deserving the contract as it does speak on what the Giants believe they can do as an organization with Eli at quarterback. Hmm. Now, the question I have, and Dave, you kind of alluded to it. So they've kind of set the window here. Do you feel it's championship or bust over the next few years now that you got Odell in place and you got Barkley in place? You, you can say what you want about the offensive line, maybe the defense too, but do you think – Championship or bust? Eric. No, I don't. I thought. I'm sorry. I thought you guys saved that. Oh. Um, no, I don't think it's championship or bust. But I think they they should be a playoff team every year for the next few years. Um, I think they should be in the hunt for it. But you know, they still got in the next couple of years. They're gonna have to pay some guys on defense too. You know. Uh, Especially Landon Collins, I gotta make you know we gotta make sure he's a leader at defense right now. Um, so uh, I mean, I'm happy with what they're doing. I just feel like I can find a way to move away from Eric Flowers. I don't think I'm just gonna I'm gonna be really happy with this team and think we're a championship team because I just think he's a terrible garbage offensive lineman. I didn't think he was. He's gonna, he's gonna get Eli killed. I didn't think he was a starter this year, though. I thought he was. I thought they moved him to the bench. I don't care where he is. If he's on the roster, I'm scared. Okay. <laughs> he's he's awful. I don't wish him on. I don't wish him on anybody's team. Okay. All right, Dave. What do you say? I I look. I don't know if it's really a matter of championship or bust. Uh, I do think it's you know an expectation. Um. You know, but f like Eric said, I mean, their biggest weakness is still the offensive line. Uh, I mean, there's no other way to put it. If they can protect, then they can win. If they can't protect, they're not going to win. That defense has enough talent on it that they can make stops. Uh, I still think Snacks Harrison is maybe one of the most underrated players in the entire league. Um, that man literally can take over a football game. Um, so, you know, Landon Collins on the back end, I mean, you know, if you're really going to nitpick that team, I think another safety or a little more talent at the linebacker position would benefit them. But I think that's more nitpicking than anything else. Um, I look at this roster uh, look last year when we did our roster predictions, I was the only guy that had them even, you know, fighting for the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Obviously we saw how that went or, you know, how that went and how things unfolded and I was wrong. 
But I still, when we, you know, next week when we do our NFC's breakdown, I think this Giant team is, you know, can win. Uh, if they have a bad year, or still coming in anywhere between six and eight wins. But I think they have the talent to be somewhere between between ten and twelve if everything goes their way. But it's all going to fall on that offensive line because Eli Manning's not escaping pressure. Uh, it's, he's just not doing it. So if you can't, if they're not smart enough to give Flowers help on the right side of the offensive line, you got to see what the uh, rookie guard Hernandez turns. Uh, I think Hernandez is his last name. Mm. But Everything you've heard about this kid, he's a freaking monster. Um, you know, I, I think that they have enough to be able to get it done, but they need to make sure that they compensate for Flowers. And if they do, I think this team really can make a good push for the playoffs. And if there's one thing I always will say about Eli Manning, he may not be the greatest regular season quarterback, but that guy has iced in his veins because you put him in the playoffs and he doesn't flinch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think on some level, and obviously, I, I don't think it's this year, but I think when you make a move like this and you have a quarterback who's nearing the end of his career like Eli Manning, but you know what he can still do, and you draft a guy like Barkley, passing over a possible quarterback of the future, I think on some level it is a championship or bust situation. But you guys brought up some good points about why the team still isn't there. but you know, in terms of offensive weapon wise, which is what the majority of the league is really based on now, I definitely think they have the tools to compete. And I'll tell you this, the NFC East preview is going to be very interesting next week because I think with the exception of the Redskins, I think every team in the division is capable of running away with the division and making a run in the championship, or they could all finish at 7-9, and 6-10. and 10. I think they could, there are a number of different possibilities for every team in the NFC East, with the exception of the Redskins, who I think we're all going to pick finish in dead last. I don't really think that's going to be too much of a shocker there. So um, the last thing I want to bring up, and I want to kind of do this real quick before we move on uh, to the division preview here. Uh, Jerry Jones, someone stuck a microphone in his face today, and he said something that I want to talk about real quick. So he said he wanted to see an 18-game regular season with two preseason games, which is kind of something that we had talked about last season, or excuse me, last week. And he said he does not believe the player's health would be adversely affected by this. And the quote is, I think candidly it's probably physically better for the players than it is to have the longer preseason, the longer practicing. Our studies show – that we actually have a ramped up injury situation with the players during preseason as opposed to the injury factor in the regular season. He acknowledged it is debatable as to whether there is more of a health risk. I think it's defensible, and really I did present it on the basis that it's something I think it does and that it's pre and that's create a safer game for the players. So Let's talk about this a little bit because I've always been of the mind that increasing the regular season to 18 games does not help benefit the player's health. I think it's a terrible idea if you're concerned about player safety. And, you know, Jerry Jones, and I have a very love-hate relationship with this guy because, yeah, all right, he's the owner of my team, but God damn it, I wish he would stop talking every once in a while. But let's hear opinions on this. And, Dave, I'll start with you first. Well, I mean, I almost feel bad going first because I, I know where Eric's going to go, and it's the same mindset I have. It's all about the money. Yeah. As, when it's all said and done, it's all about the money. But the I saw so, one of the guys I follow on Twitter made a really good point of how about if you want to go to an 18-game season, why don't you eliminate the preseason and allow players to actually hit each other and tackle and play practice and do training camp the way they used to? And guys will be prepared for the season without preseason games. I, I thought that was a great point. Um, you know, some of the things that would come along with this would have to be, you'd have to increase roster size. There's no way you could play an 18-game season and only have a 53-man roster. You just go through bodies way too quickly. 
Yeah. So you'd have to increase roster size. You, the salary cap would have to go up. Players would get more money. Um, you know, look, i rather watch two more regular season games than watch any preseason games at all. Um, you know, and it's getting to the point where owners and management and coaches are getting so worried about guys getting hurt in their preseason games that they won't even play starters sometimes. And then you have other coaches that put guys out there and say, hey, it'll be what it'll be. But uh, I just, I really don't, I, I don't think there's a win in this for players. I think the win in it always is going to be for owners. But the owners will be able to spin the story that, you know, well, players are getting more money. And players will be like, well, actually, it's the same amount of money, but now it's stretched over 18 weeks instead of 16 weeks. Like, that's really what it is. But they'd have to mix in an extra bye week, most likely. You would have to add, increase your roster uh, size. There's a lot of different changes and things that you would have to do outside of just, oh, we'll get rid of two preseason games and put in two regular season games. There's a lot more to it than, that you would have to do than just say, do that. Mm -hmm. And just to bring up uh, some points that are in the chat room right now, uh, Cousin David actually agreed with you that uh, the salary cap uh, should go up if they do that and the players' pay should go up. And he brought up an interesting point here. That the players' union should trade 18 games for guaranteed contracts, the reasoning being it's time, which is a very interesting take on my mind. Eric, what do you say? Jerry Jones could not be moved. Could not be more full of shit. He <laughs> is, I mean, it's a big steaming pile of it. He is, he is in it for the money. They've yeah. said it. I, I got to repeat it. It is all about the money because they're still keeping the same amount of games, still selling the same amount of tickets. You know, there's, there's nothing to it. You know what I mean? Like, they're going to benefit even more from it, actually, and the players aren't going to see a dime extra. That's why they're saying, oh, well, we'll take two preseason away, but we'll make them regular season games, and that'll make everybody more excited. No, whoa. Just still playing the same amount of stupid games. You got to shorten the season, or not necessarily the season. If you want to have 18, one preseason game, if that. Like you said, practice and pads, hit each other. Maybe you have one scrimmage, and then you go into the season. You want to do something like that, but they'll never agree to that because they're never going to agree to ro bigger rosters and paying out players more money. That's less money for the owners. That makes no, that makes no sense for them. It doesn't make dollars. It doesn't make sense. These owners aren't going for that. They're smarter than that. This is a ploy on Jerry Jones' part. Because like you, said, they, uh, like you said, they can now say, oh, okay, well, fine. We'll give you those two regular season games, and you give us the guaranteed key contracts. But with the guaranteed contract, you're not getting bigger rosters. You're not getting bigger, you know, dollars. You're just getting guaranteed dollars. But the contracts will be different. Believe me, the owners will find new ways to work the contracts. They're not going to give guys five years and, you know, whatever Odell's was, what was it, like 95 or something like that? It was something stupid. There's only 65 is guaranteed, something like that. Yeah. Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you know, they're not going to guarantee 95. Maybe they would have guaranteed 75 instead. But he's not going to make out better. You know, the players are never going to make out better. The, the owners are always going to find a way to make more money. So they do. It's a businessman. It's a business. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this. You guys bring up an interesting point in terms of uh, um, uh, eliminating the preseason games, going back to practices and pads. I'll go one further on that. Because uh, over the last few years, we've seen the rise of uh, teams having joint practice sections. And, you know, you want to eliminate a couple of the preseason games. Let's get a few more joint practices going between the teams. Yeah, you'll have a ton of fights. There will be a ton of fights. If yeah, but happens. they can't sell any tickets. That's the problem. They can't sell tickets. That. They can sell tickets no, to no, the season saying, ticket I'm holders. I'm saying the that way, for the preseason. That, that, that they're never going to take that money out of their own pocket. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, if, if you go by you guys' idea, where you go to 18 games and you eliminate and go down to one preseason game, that's how you replace it. Is you have the the, the joint uh, practices between the teams. That that's one way to do that because you're still in a way simulating the game experience and you're preparing. Yeah, but it's not about simulating the games. It's about selling the tickets. Yeah, but you're still selling the tickets with the 18 games, is what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, but, you, but you, 
right now they're getting 20 games out of you. They're getting 20 games because you get four preseason, 16 regular season. You either yeah, get 20 games you, out of you. They're not shortening the amount of games they get out of you. Let me ask you, let me ask you something, though. If you think about it, though, and first of all, I, I don't want them to go to 18 games. I think it's a terrible idea. I don't think anything is going to stop the health factor. I think the amount of injuries is already way too high. You go to 18 games, it's going to be higher. But let me ask you something. you got the four preseason games right now. Do you really think if they take two of those preseason games, they turn them to regular season games, they won't sell more tickets to those two regular season games? Then they will all four preseason games combined because I think they will. Mm. No, certain stadiums won't. I I don't know if I agree with that. I think there'll be more co- money coming in off of those two regular season games than all four preseason games they currently have combined. Between TV ratings, between what goes uh, uh, tickets sold, between concession stands sales, the whole thing. I don't the think TV, so. Forget, and what about the TV package getting expanded? Because now you have those games as part of your regular uh, NBC and CBS package. The whole thing, the whole that's why the owners want it, if anything, because they know they're going to double their money off those two regular season games as opposed to the four preseason games. Yeah, but they're not going to give any of that. That's what I'm saying is the owners are just doing it to make more money. None of that money is going to go to the players. Uh, money's uh, they, they might, like I said, even if they get their guaranteed contracts, those contracts are going to be lower in total value. They're going to find ways around it. They're going to settle in the middle, like I said, with like a deal like Odell's. They would have settled around 75 instead. Yeah. We got 15 a year guaranteed, and that would have been a great contract for a wide receiver. And, you know, if, if that's the way they were going to go with it, but they're not. It, it, it makes no sense for the owners to do. They're not making any more money. They, you know, with – Adding the two regular season games and minusing the preseason games, yeah, they make more money. But by doing that, you're still playing the same amount of games. So I guarantee they're not talking about bigger rosters and bigger budgets for teams because that's just more money they got to shell out. All right. Okay. Um, I mean, unfortunately, I tend to agree with you on that point. That's one of the many reasons why I don't want to see them to go to an 18 game schedule. We got to wrap this up. We gotta it waters up. down the talent pool, too. Yeah. Yeah. That's another good reason. I'll give you that. Dave, let's get your final point on this, and then we'll move on. I think we've said all we need to say about it, to be honest. Okay, fair enough. Let's move to the AFC East. So we will have our AFC East preview right now. I think all three of us can kind of agree. Um, I can sum this up in one word. Uh, the Patriots will win this division again. Uh, we don't really need to go too much farther, but for the sake of argument here, Buffalo makes the playoffs last season for the first time in 20 years. This year, they come back. They let Tyrod Taylor go. They brought in A.J. McCarron, two-year contract. He is already out for the majority of the season with a broken collarbone. Josh Allen was drafted in the first round by them. I feel there's a good chance he winds up starting the majority of their games this season because Nathan Peterman is not a legitimate NFL quarterback, in my opinion. Miami finishes last season at 6-10. and They had Jay Cutler playing the game with Brian Tannehill out. Tannehill is back this season, but I think we can all agree that the talent level on both the offense and defense is taking a tremendous step back. With Jarvis Landry and Jay Gaye both getting traded uh, in the middle of last season and over this past offseason. And then you have the Jets, who we all thought there was a possibility they would go 0-16 last season. They did not go 0-16 last season. They actually went 5-11. Uh, and admired in their own mediocrity. And then miraculously, they made out in the NFL draft and got the player they wanted the whole year in Sam Darnold. Very good possibility he winds up starting the majority of the games for them this season. So that is the AFC East in a nutshell there. Let's get some thoughts on the division here. we got about eight minutes left in the program. Dave, let's start with you. Um, I mean, look, I think the Jets end up going Darnold uh, week one, and he ends up being your starter for the season, even though I do think it might be better for them to let, give him a, you know, a couple weeks you know, to kind of just watch. But you know what? You're going to take a guy that high, you better be ready to go play, and they're giving him every opportunity. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and act like I've watched his games, but from things you hear and read and see, it kind of seems that, um, you know, a lot of people think that he's done enough to earn that starting job, uh, but definitely some growing pains. Miami, to me, has done nothing but take steps backwards. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe got better or broke about even when it comes down to the quarterback position between Tannehill and Cutler. 
Um, you know, happy to see Tannehill healthy and, you know, back out there. Good for him. But basically a break even at best in that quarterback position. Uh, Buffalo, uh, I they have done nothing that makes me excited about that team. I mean, what, they traded for Corey Coleman from Cleveland. Uh, really just haven't done much, um, you know, when it comes down to anything that I think is going to make them better. So I kind of think they take a step back. And, look, New England's New England. As long as they got Brady and Belichick, they're winning that division. Um, and, you know, I, I think what will be interesting to see is what that team looks like if something happens to Gronk injury-wise, which we usually expect on a year-in, year-out basis. So I think that's really the biggest question mark for them. I mean, defensively, Belichick just makes adjustments. I always laugh because, you know, what, last year they got blown out by Kansas City on, uh, for the season opener and then I think finished the year at 11-5 and five or 12-4 and four or something like that. So 13-3, actually. Oh, okay. So even better than what I thought. So 13-3. and three. Um, You know, and that was after getting their asses handed to them in the opening game. So I really just think that, you know, it's New England's division and everybody else is kind of fighting for second place and, I don't think any of the other three teams have enough to make the playoffs this year. Fair enough. Uh, Eric, what do you got? The Patriots, the rest of the league is garbage. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but not really. As we know, yeah, yeah. Kind of <laughs> you know the I, Patriots are at the top of the division. They're going to be good. They're, they're always solid, like you said, as long as they have Brady and Belichick to find a way to win games. So they do there. Buffalo. Who knows what you're going to get out of them. You know, hopefully this is a year where Allen can start most of the games. I think experience and NFL experience is the best way to learn, Um, especially with a young quarterback. I hope the Jets give Darnold a chance. And who knows what Miami's going to do. I think it was a loss losing a guy like Landry. Um, I think he was talented. I mean, he's got more catches, I think, in his first four years than anybody in NFL history. Um, He you know, played and hard for him. So I, he's well, at. Say that I mean, again? Think about that. Most catches in NFL history over the first four years of your career, but think about the quarterbacks he's had to play with. Uh, that just tells I you. I know. How. Imagine if he played with a good one. Yeah, exactly. Sorry to interrupt. I just no. had to that real quick. No, no. So, I mean, you don't know what you're going to get out of Miami. I agree with you guys. Uh, rest of the division doesn't really have enough to get in the playoffs this year. So it's, it's, it's the Patriots and then, uh, I don't know, everybody else jumbled up. Well, I'll tell you this. If what we've seen over the last couple of weeks is any indication, apparently the best chance any of these teams would have to beat the Patriots would be just send their defenders out with, with pictures of Alex Guerrero and then have a quotation under the picture saying, is he traveling with you guys? Apparently, that's the best way to get Tom Brady flustered. You heard the WEEI interview from yesterday. So I thought that was funny. I'm sorry you guys didn't. Anyway, uh, let's go to divisions here. And let's go to predictions here. We got about three and a half minutes left on the program. I'm going to start with my predictions first. Um, uh, obviously, uh, listen, we're all going to have the Patriots winning this I'm going to put them at 12 and 4. I'm going to say Buffalo does take a slight step back, but they still got a pretty good defense. It'll be very interesting to see what Josh Allen does with this offense. Kelvin Benjamin, Corey Coleman, still got LaShawn McCoy if he doesn't get himself suspended for what happened in the offseason. So I'm going to put the uh, the Bills at 8-8. Eight eight. The Jets, I'm going to say back by Sam Darnold. I'm going to say they go from five wins to a 7-9 and nine record. And the Dolphins, for all the reasons you guys have already said, I'm going to put them last in this division at 5-11. That's my prediction. Dave, what do you got? I got New England at eleven and five. I got Buffalo at seven and nine. I got the Jets at six and ten, and I got Miami at four and twelve. Okay, Eric, what do you got? I got uh, Patriots at eleven and five. I got uh, the Bills at six and ten. The Jets at six and ten. And the Dolphins at five and eleven. Okay, I think all three predictions are entirely reasonable. 
So that's going to do it for the uh, AFC East preview here. We got about two minutes left in the show. I want to thank everybody <laughs> for listening to my cousin David. Thank you, as always. Yo, David Hastings, Eric Tressler, as always, I thank you both for being here. Let's get some last words from both of you guys. Eric Tressler. Um, last words for me are going to be go Yanks. And, I mean, we're closing in on Boston. I know uh, – we're a little closer than we were a week ago, so I like where we're heading. Turn for Alabama next week, a quarterback. Uh, a fair question. I don't know. I would maybe I, – to me, I would maybe still start Jalen Hurts, and then if he starts to struggle – go. I mean, the guy's 26-2 and two as a starter. It's kind of hard not to start him. Um. I, that, that's who I think I would go with to start. And then if something happens, God forbid, he has a bad series or two to start the game, I wouldn't hesitate to put uh, two in. Hmm. All right. Stay sweaty, Eric. Dave Hastings. Stay Hastings. sweaty. Yep. Dave Hastings, uh, final words. Just want to shout out uh, happy birthday to my dad up there. Yesterday was his birthday. Miss him. I know he'd love listening to us. Eric, I know you got a chance to meet him, hang out with him a couple times. So, shout out to Pops. Happy birthday to him. Up, uh, up happy with the- birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you, Pop, man. Rest in peace. I always see you putting stuff up there, and I always feel so bad for you. I just never really know what to say on that one. So. No, it's all good, man. He was a great man. That's all that matters. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. That's going to do it for us here tonight. Once again, thank you all for listening. And we, I am your host, Mike Edgar Laurel, and we will see y'all next week.